meeting of the Waterbury Select Board for Monday, August 15, 2022 at the Steel Community Room. Uh, meeting, first thing on the agenda is to approve the agenda. I'll move to approve the agenda. Is there a second? A second. I make uh, one amendment to the agenda just to include in the select board item a brief update on the uh, town manager search. That is acceptable. And can I also add a letter of support for WASI for a grant application? Sure. We might not need to, but I missed that it was a fifth, fifth Monday month. So I'm assuming it's a uh, thanks. Is there any objections to the amendments to the agenda? No. If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. We now move to the uh, consent agenda items on the, uh, that were presented on the list. Well, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. Thank I'll you. Second it. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussions on the consent agenda items? There being none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Now is the portion of the uh, select board where we invite the uh, public uh, to make, if they have something of concern that they want to let the select board know, we encourage them to come forward, say your name, uh, and uh, and say and say if you're a resident of Waterbury, and if you have any concerns that you would like to select board to do. Does anyone wish to come forward, or I don't I don't Nobody's believe on there Zoom. are any people on additional people on Zoom. Nothing. If there's nothing for the public, we'll move on to the rest of the agenda. Yes. Okay. First item for the select board to discuss um, the emergency management plan. Gary, uh, if you want to come forward. Of course. I did want. you do the consent agenda? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. You did? <laughs> wow. Yeah, we'll move right back. Our motion was made by CBN, okay. seconded by all. Last unanimous. Yeah. Jeez, I, was, I, mean, I was counting. Uh, <laughs> didn't hear anything. Time flies when you're having fun. I've been here in 21 years as a fire chief, and we've not, I've not been late. <laughs> you're never late. I'm never late. You're never late. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Wow. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. All right. Any questions? Did everybody see this, Bill? Um, probably not. Okay, so this, for those of you that were around last year, that Barb would have provided it, and the year before, and the year before, this really is not any different other than updated names. The bill of copy I gave you, the date at the top hadn't carried through, and so I've changed that. But this is all boilerplate information that the vast majority of the towns in Waterton do not use. Um, big towns, uh, cities that have full-time employees in much more areas to cover, might have a more in-depth program. Oh, well, this is pretty well in-depth. It covers a lot of stuff. But it's all boilerplate stuff um, without knowing what you might be thinking. Just trying to figure out. Uh, I, don't, I really don't have much more to say. Has anything changed since uh, the flood of 2011? All of this is reflective of after the flood. In 2011 so this really picked up when Barb came on board because um, it was kind of piecemeal I think yeah we had I mean like like so many communities in Vermont uh, we had an emergency management plan it was on a bookshelf in the corner of somebody's office and it gathered dust and even during Irene while uh, some of it was implemented uh, most of what was implemented was implemented through the fire department and the fact that they have an emergency management plan um, and um, the uh, what is it incident command system yeah. set up 
And we, we really didn't have an incident command uh, model kind of, it may have been on the shelf, but it really wasn't there and uh, wasn't really implemented. Um, so the fire department always, before uh, Irene happened, ever since I've been here, they've always had some semblance of an incident command uh, plan set up and they, they have designated uh, officers and uh, line officers that are given certain responsibilities. And they have a, uh, you know, they, they train a lot and they have uh, training for various scenarios. They have done tabletop exercises. Um, about a, three months before Irene, not even three months before Irene, probably a month and a half before Irene, I went to Stowe and I took the incident command, uh, what is it, uh, one? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, there's a bunch of different lower levels, but you probably would have taken one for uh, municipal managers and, and yeah. so I, I, I took class. I took that incident command uh, module, and you know the eyes rolled back in my head, and it's just nothing. It's not the way my mind works. So anyway, uh, Barb, who was the Vermont Emergency Management Director. Uh, and, and left that position just months before Irene. When we hired her uh, through um, the consulting firm that she worked for, one of the things we asked her to do in that consulting firm to do was to get us up more to speed with this plan. Um, and all select board members' names should be in there someplace. Uh, we should actually, at some point, have a meeting where Gary comes in and talks about how this should be implemented. Uh, and and uh, when Irene happened, um, we figured it out. But if we had followed that, it may have been a little bit easier. The people who had to follow it, followed it. The fire department really did their job. Uh, the rest of us got the jobs done, just we didn't have kind of the organizational tree that is envisioned in these management plans. So it needs to be updated every, or authorized, approved every year or so. Uh, so we'd ask you to do that. Uh, Gary's looked at it. Uh, Barb uh, did a lot of work on it last year with Gary. So I'm confident it's in order. But at some point, we really should have uh, a meeting where it's the only thing that we do. Um, it was probably a year and a half ago we were scheduled to do a full tabletop exercise right. with all of the staff members and even some of the select board members. But um, because of certain things that were going on in the community, Main Street sure. construction was a big deal. Uh, we scaled it way back, the uh, uh, wastewater department and the water department played a small role in that. But there are training exercises that are done that we should avail ourselves of at some point. Incident command system, the incident command system, uh, it, I can't stress enough how really easy it is once you understand it. And it's not hard to get to understand it. It's, a lot of the classes are online. I can certainly share you the links uh, to take a lot of classes online. Some of them are way beyond what I would even suggest that you take. And I, I was a nationally certified instructor, so I get how uh, your eyes might roll in some of the classes that you would never need here. Um, but some of the lower level ones, it gives you a grasp of how the incident command system works, who's in charge, and the whole hierarchy of the process. It's very simple. Bill's right, our fire department uses it for every call, no matter how simple it is. Every time the truck rolls out and every time we go do a training, that's what we use because it's easy. Right. And because we have the manager form of government here and we have a fairly robust staff, the role of the elected officials is minor compared to what it would be in Duxbury or Moortown, for example, because they, those boards are not only legislative bodies, but they're the executives as well. 
So anyway, at some point we should do something with this to give them a little bit of a flavor, but that's not tonight. Yeah, and, and quite honestly, even I, I, I've got to check with emergency management because they really haven't done much with the instructors for the last couple of years because of COVID. But I'll verify with them whether or not they're still certifying people. And even if they aren't, I can still do a refresher class. Some morning we can pick a morning and we can just sit here, have coffee and a bagel or a donut. And right. Do it in a couple hours and then you've at least got a handle on it. So this was not emailed out to you? I mean, Carla's been pretty busy with her election. I think so. On vacation, so mm -hmm. It was supposed to be emailed out and if it wasn't, you know, I'll take responsibility for it. But Has it changed since last year? Um, no, other than names. Okay. Yeah, right. I mm -hmm. went through this. Uh, it kind of makes my eyes roll um, <laughs> because I'm more action oriented as opposed to this. Um, but this gives everybody the boilerplate of what we should be concerned about in our community. Right. Uh, for me, I just give me the emergency and I can deal with that. So we'll we'll email it to all of you. You should just read it. You don't have to read it like you're going to take a test, but just read through it so you understand. It, and then sometime down the road, we should take up Terry's offer to just have a little bit of a, a training on it. It is good information because I know I've been involved with USDA with a lot of disasters, and they're on a bigger scale, so you really see where this comes in. But to me, what the important thing is, it gives you a framework of who does what, and if say the fire departments kind of a bunch of them are all out of town for whatever reason and something happens it at least gives you a good frame of reference for who you know even if you pick up the document you could see you who may who may you call to do what some of it's very common sense but it really doesn't hurt you know i i think disaster preparedness is something really important and I think, you know, I, I know what Gary's saying, and sometimes, you know, it's come second nature to him and probably a lot of people, especially in public safety, it is a second nature. But people like us who, you know, a little bit outside the trenches here, you know, we, we just may want to have a good sense because we never know if we're going to have another Irene or another. No, we're going to have another one. Oh, yeah. But, you know, and then it's a matter of how, how prepared we are. And that's one of the reasons why I was a little concerned. Yeah, I know Barb wanted me to become the emergency management director. And I was just concerned with, you know, elderly parents and potentially being out of state, and especially my role in the select board. I said, I, you know, might not be the right time. And I felt Gary would, would do a great job. And I think he has. So. Thank you. No, I'm just going to say, you know, I mean, just keep in mind that even though we're talking to select board members, um, during an emergency, you, you, you don't get to play the, I'm, a, I'm on the select board and I, this is what I want. It's just understand the whole scope as opposed to, it's, it's, it's about official position and hierarchy that we have as opposed to what your title is sitting here. In fact, there are times when we get to a fire and somebody else that is lower in rank than I am is already called in second hand because that's what we do. Uh, I work for that person. It could be an assistant chief, it could be a lieutenant. So that's just the way it works. I might take over, but not always. I'm curious to know, <clears throat> in every day, Typical emergencies, probably this thing is um, quite resourceful, but when it comes to mm -hmm. major catastrophes, it's like anything you, and you mentioned it earlier, uh, interaction oriented. Um, it's like zoning regs. Uh, they, they don't always cover everything, you know? Uh, right. Sometimes you gotta fly by the seat of your pants uh, because major catastrophes are just that. They're catastrophes that either nobody's been through before um, or so so violent that uh, it's like kicking over a handheld, you know, all hands or, or scurrying to, 
to figure it out. Right. It's, it's, you're, you're, it's, you're right. You, we, we're, the fact that we're a small community and we know the people that can do certain things, you're going to go after those people, even if, the, if they're in the private sector. And, you know, because if you're overwhelmed, the fire department's overwhelmed, and you need services. Uh, yeah, and we and we did that. This, right, I mean, this isn't me. this isn't. I mean, some of the plans, you know, I don't know if this one does, but there are some bigger plans that identify where the child care centers are, it does. Uh, how you might evacuate them, you know, who's got buses, all these resources are listed. People who have excavators and bucket loaders and heavy equipment, all that stuff is listed in the plans. And, and it's there to try to provide a resource to make it easier to figure out who you can call when you have help. But, but as much as it is about dealing with the emergency on the ground, it also speaks to how you communicate with the public, who makes decisions, uh, who speaks for the community. So, you know, um, you should have one public information officer, one person who's responsible, or at least one on any given shift. If it's a, if it's a, uh, an emergency that goes over several days, I and mean, nobody can stay up 24 hours a day for a week, even though we tried. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you might have, you know, okay, I'm the public information officer from 8 in the morning till 8 at night, and then somebody else is going to do it from 8 at night until 8 in the morning. And who do you go to to make certain decisions? When we sent Bob Butler out to deal with, you know, getting the, the dumpsters that we needed to get over on Randall Street, down at South End of Main Street, and over on, on Union Street, you know, he was given certain authority. But then he had to come back to me and say, okay, I can do this, this, and this, and then, okay, do it. And so it's, it's, it's designed to help build a chain of command and to inform the public who they should look to to provide information when there's an emergency. So, but you're right. So, I mean, if you have, I mean, Irene was, you know, we don't have a playbook for Irene. No. And, and the plan that we had, even if we had exercised it three days beforehand that wouldn't have covered every scenario, right? Yeah. No, and, and as much as it talks this and the incident command system talks about who does what, it also is an indicator of who doesn't do what. If somebody, as Bill referred to the public information officer, if you're not it, Chris, and somebody from the press comes to talk to you, you don't talk to them. <laughs> you know, it, it, refer them to the right place because then you, start having mixed messages when people want to be helpful and it's it is not yeah i know you're i mean i'm aware of the fact you gotta have a go-to person you know yeah so th that's really what this is and what incident command is all about it, it streamlines it things are a lot smoother um I've, you know over the years been to a lot of fires and that take hours and hours and Everybody knows who's responsible for what. And emergencies such as Irene are problematic, but they can still work in the same manner. My only question was we have some um, staff changes coming up. So I know in the past, like Carla's had a number of roles and given that she's retiring, is she already edited out or is that a she conversation is not, that I would have with someone? It's a, if you click on a computer, it's, you know, as things change, and I wouldn't wait until the end of next year when this is due to be replaced mm -hmm. it's just a matter of making the changes when bill gets done i think he's going to subcontract for a couple more years <laughs> <laughs> so it, it it is really just a click of the keys thank you thanks so, so much we're going to ask you one more quick question of course no, I yeah. no. Um, what, how have your number of calls been we're a little high right now but it, we have so much fluctuation that we, and we had a call the other day, but we didn't have one today. So it, we just don't know. Right now we're at, I think, 110, and we were at 177 last year. So if it keeps down this path, we'll be higher than last year. If, I mean, there's always times when we might not have a call for a week or two. You never know. But 
10 or so years ago, we had 343 in a year. So it really depends on a lot of it, uh, the weather, um, the interstate, that I mean, we can have 10 calls in one day on the interstate. Mm -hmm. It's not unreasonable. Well, it's unreasonable. <laughs> not unexpected. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Ah, no problem. Thanks, Gary. That's it. Okay, next item of the agenda. Um, I do need a motion. Should I make a motion to adopt the emergency management? Yeah, plan? well, we probably haven't seen it, so I don't know if we should. Okay, then we might. We'll wait till the next meeting if you yeah, want. Yeah, I think we should. Oh. I kind of know, know what it is, but I think everyone should at least read it. Yeah, I think it was. Okay. We'll then move on to the next item is uh, Stowe Street speeding. Right. And I'll tell you that I got a D in handwriting and I never got more than a C in art. So you <laughs> have to, that's the best I can do when it comes to freehand art. Uh, so you're not a graph maker. <laughs> Yeah, he probably could have done it better. Um, are there people here that want to talk about this before I say anything? Okay. So um, Danny sent to me a week and a half or so ago uh, an email and suggested that somebody had emailed to her and had some concerns about Stowe Street and speeding on Stowe Street. Um, and especially now that the street has been resurfaced and is smooth and um, un unpainted except for some crosswalks right now. Um, so Chris has heard this spiel before. I don't think any of the others of you were on the board. Maybe Mike was. But um, just so everyone understands, uh, as far as speeds are concerned, uh, municipalities by state statute are authorized to set the speed limits on town highways, highways that are controlled and owned by the town. And we can set speed limits between the limits of 25 miles an hour on the low end and 50 miles an hour on the high end. You can't go below 25. Uh, that is state law. Um, when you set speed limits, this there may be an updated version of this. This is from 2016, but frankly hasn't changed in the 35 years that I've been here. Setting speed limits, the guide for Vermont towns. Um, a road like Stowe Street, which is a high volume road, you typically have um, uh, the Regional Planning Commission or some other entity put a tube across the road and, and count traffic because it is a high volume road. Um, uh, smaller streets um, such as Neyland Flats, it's a little smaller, Maple Street, uh, certainly streets like Guile Hill, um, even Upper Blush Hill, uh, those kind of streets should typically do what's called uh, speed monitoring. Um, uh, uh, a pace setting arrangement. And the manual basically tells you that you don't want to arbitrarily set speeds just because you want people to go slow. The speed of the highway should be based on how the street is engineered, how it's designed, and how it's built. And what the manual says is that, for the most part, the average driver will drive at a speed that is safe for that street, all things being equal. And I think you probably all have experienced that yourself. You're out on a, a town highway, and you're going along, and, and then it, you know, it gets a little narrower, or there's a bunch more driveways, you typically decide to slow down a little bit. So back in the day, um, I, I worked with VTrans to set the speed limits on all of the town and village streets. And when we did the village, um, I recommended to the uh, 
village trustees at the time who were responsible for setting village speed limits, I recommended that Main Street and Stowe Street should be 30, 30 miles an hour uh, based on the speed studies that we did. Um, and if you drive those streets, um, 30 miles an hour seems fairly reasonable, I think. And I think all of you, if you drive on Stowe Street and you go 30 miles an hour, you're not going to feel like you're going excessively fast and you're not going to feel like you're crawling. Uh, so I recommended 30 miles an hour. The trustees at the time said, no, it's too fast. We want all the streets in the village to be 25. So they were set at 25 and they've been 25 since the early 1990s probably. All the streets in the village are 25 miles an hour. And although the state law says that speed studies are necessary, engineering traffic studies are necessary to set a speed limit, it also says if the speed limit has been up and posted for a certain period of time, and I can't remember if it's three years or five years, it's grandfathered in. So the fact that if you did a speed study on Stowe Street or Main Street today, if an engineer said it should be 30 or 35, you could say, well, it's been posted at 25 for 30 years and it, it's okay, and the, the court would uphold that. Um, I don't dispute anybody who has written in and said, you know, they observe vehicles going 50 miles an hour. I was out heading down to, uh, to get lunch down at uh, near Rusty Parker Park today, and I crossed the street at 51 South Main Street, and I got into the middle of the crosswalk and some pickup truck coming down Bank Hill. He didn't see me or didn't know it was me. But he was, he was flying. I mean, he must have been, you know, I don't know how fast he was going. I don't have radar detectors in my eyes. But I'm sure he was going, going close to 50 miles an hour. And he was a young kid, and he was just making a point, feeling his oats. There was nobody else on the street. So I just stood in the middle of the street and <laughs> waited for him to come up. And then I said, it's 25 miles an hour. And then he gave me the finger and bounced. <laughs> so I understand that people drive fast and, and nobody likes it when it's in their neighborhood. I went out today at, at three minutes past five until 5.33 and I sat on North Street up above the speed limit sign facing downhill and 56 cars passed by in that half hour span. And the low speed that went through was about 19 miles an hour and the high speed that went through was 38 miles an hour. But you can see this bell curve. Uh, you know, there were, there were nine cars that went between 20 and 25. So there were 10 cars that were below the speed limit. Then from 25 to 30, there were 25 vehicles that went that speed. That was the highest number of vehicles that went any particular speed. And then from 30 to 35, it was 18 vehicles. There were three vehicles that went over 35 and nobody went over 40. Now, I'm not saying that an hour earlier or two hours later that somebody won't go through there at 60 miles an hour, but this bell curve is exactly what you would expect to see. And the, the state speed limit says that when you're setting a speed limit, you should set the speed limit at a number at which 85% of the vehicles are traveling slower than that number. So that means there's gonna be 15% of the vehicles that are speeding almost all the time. Now, I didn't do the math, I'm not quick enough to, to do it, but I think that there's more than, uh, you know, the more than 85% of these vehicles are probably traveling uh, under, under 30. Well, maybe not. Um, close, though. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's, it's an issue. Uh, Woody's here to talk a little bit about some of the um, things that we might be able to do with, with painting lines. Um, I did send Danny's email and then some of the front porch forum posts that, we, that we've all seen. I think, to Lieutenant White at the State Police and just said, you know, uh, in general, if you could pick up speed enforcement, it would be helpful.
But as I said to you in the, well, as I said in the front porch forum post, and people don't like to hear it, um, the police, their priorities in terms of law enforcement are dealing with the property crimes and the disturbances, and nowadays even the shootings that we even have in places like Waterbury, that's all related to the stupid drug trade. And, uh, you know, that's where their efforts are. So. Uh, Lieutenant White, I, I didn't forward it, I don't think. I believe it's on the website, but we have the, uh, on the website, the police reports are up there, I think, for May, June, and April, May, and June. I'm not sure we have the July one yet. But in uh, May and June, they, they only had three traffic stops each. And I asked Lieutenant White, I said, got to try to do a little better than that. Uh, you know, when we had the village police department, I would talk to, you know, Wayne Sordiff and Doug Howe and Bill Wolf and Joby Fisha, all the chiefs that I worked with and said, you know, if, if your guy out on the shift can, can uh, you know, make one stop per shift, that would be great. But even that was hard to do when we had uh, four, four and a half full-time village officers because they were, responding to so so many calls so it's it's low on the priority list for the police department i did call the washington county sheriff's department last week <clears throat> and ask them if they um, still do traffic enforcement by contract they do they have a contract with uh, a couple of the valley towns waitsfield and uh, warren i think maybe more town um, and uh, I asked them if they had capacity to, to do it here. Now, we're spending, you know, uh, $1,000 a day right now on the state police contract. More than that, it's three, $385,000 a, a year that we, we pay uh, the state police contract this year is uh, $384,000. Um, I don't know if there's an appetite or a desire to spend any more. The Washington County Sheriff's Department uh, would charge, they, they do, they do, um, they do it. Um, that basically confirms your bell curve, Bill. I think oh. The okay. <clears throat> So is this Stowe Street? Yeah, from a few years ago. All right, so the 85th percentile here, I'll just pass this around. Uh, this was, um, let's see the date on here, but anyway, we, we had this done, and the 85th percentile was 31 miles an hour. So it's, it's confirming what I saw this afternoon. Anyway, the Washington County Sheriff's Department, if you want to do additional uh, traffic enforcement in the town uh, to supplement what the state police can do because the state police, as I said, are spending most of their time on criminal activity. Not that speeding isn't criminal, but it's, it's not the, uh, you know, it's low hanging fruit and people like to see it. You know, the general public, they know when somebody speeds as opposed to there's a crack house down the road, right? They, they know about the speeding. They're not sure about uh, the other problems that the police are dealing with. But the Sheriff's Department uh, charges 31 and a quarter an hour plus mileage, which is uh, 62 and a half cents a mile. Uh, they could do uh, a minimum of three to four hours if they came to town, um, and the, uh, the clock for both the mileage and the um, hourly rate starts when they leave their office in Montpelier and stops when they get back to their office in Montpelier. And Brett Meyer, the captain who used to be a Waterbury police officer here, told me, you know, if, if you wanted this service, um, you know, if, if we have a guy going to the valley and they're gonna do three or four hours down there, 
uh, on the way back, they could stop in Waterway and do three or four hours here. And he said we would split the, you know, the to and from Montpelier in that case, and you know, try to give both communities a break. I'm not recommending necessarily that you do this. Uh, we have a little bit of money in that we didn't uh, we didn't hire that um, community service officer that we talked about hiring, which is in the same public safety budget, I believe. No, I guess that's in health and human health and something else. But we didn't spend that money, uh, and we budgeted. Uh, for this year, uh, we budgeted almost $25,000 for that position. So why don't you let Woody talk to you about the, the um, you know, the paving project and the painting that still needs to be done, and then if you have questions of me, you can ask them. Uh, I did just want to interject that uh, the state police were in force uh, on the road mm -hmm. uh, last Wednesday night and picked up my 17-year-old son <laughs> to 35 for a nice healthy ticket to get him to drive uh, yeah. more responsibly. I, I was, oh, no. was going to say that since I, sent, um, since I sent that email to Lieutenant White, Bill told me that he saw them over there twice, and I saw them once last week, and obviously your son saw them as well. So, <laughs> so they, are, they are doing their job. Bill, I think I know the answer to this, but if and when we do go ahead and hire the community service officer, I know we're talking more like parking and stuff like that. They can't issue speeding tickets. No, so that, that's beyond there. No, you have to be a right. You have to be, you have certified. To be a certified law enforcement yeah. officer to do I'm that. Bad. So anyway, Woody's here. So as you know, the street's blank right now, a blank slate. So uh, I think it was last year we began looking at uh, options on possible, possible ways to slow people down with some inventive line striping or something like that. Um, I've spoken with several traffic engineers, other people who are used to line striping, et cetera. Um, you can find theories both ways. Um, a guy today told me he thought if we left the street blank, studies show that slows traffic down. <laughs> so, because you would pull out on the road and you're new and you're saying, you know, I don't know. So you go slow. Uh, so that's that's a theory there. Um, but the one I think I'm most fond of is we're going to paint, hopefully paint the yellow lines. The state paints our yellow lines, class two roadways in town. Um, and they, one guy has recommended that we narrow the lane widths mm -hmm. with a white fog line, yellow lines down the middle and a white fog line. Um, Picking the number for the width is is kind of arbitrary. You know, anywhere from 10 feet to 10 and a half feet to 11 feet. That'll leave a small shoulder area, but it might help funnel the traffic and give the illusion that the street is narrower than it actually is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's options out there. Town of Williston did some center line striping where they take the yellow and then they mm -hmm. bulb the yellow out. You know, looks like a bad paint job, but you know, the, the goal is almost looks like a little island there. Um, you know, Stowe Street's got widths all over the board. Um, it's not really wide enough to have, you know, bike lanes or anything like that. Um, there's spots between Railroad and High Street where Stowe Street really isn't wide enough to have parking on both sides of the street. Um, even though, as Gary knows, it's constantly yes. there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so we've looked into a lot of those things um, that may or may not slow traffic down. Um, as Bill put in some of his stuff, we already do with the radar feedback signs and the center line pedestrian crosswalk things um, that do help slow traffic, we hope, and make it safer for pedestrians. But, um, you know, sh short of you know, drastic measures. It seems to be some sort of line striping or no line striping. That that might be an option. Can you update yeah. us on the sidewalk, Stowe Street sidewalk project? Wasn't that? 
Yeah, schedule. so there's going to be a little sidewalk. Yeah, there's a section of sidewalk that's being designed from Swayze Court north on the westerly side mm -hmm. of the road. Um, probably a couple hundred feet is still waiting on plans from the design engineers. And would that include a crosswalk, thinking about where the students from the elementary school often cross down to that field and the river? Or could um, it? There, I don't think there was a design for a crosswalk down where they typically walk mm -hmm. across to go skiing. Um, my hope was that they would come out, cross at the intersection of High Street and Swayze, and then you would And side the sidewalk street. would go all the way to that spot. Uh, oh, okay, excellent. Yeah, excellent. we really hope that they would use the crosswalk sure. that's there now, because you put, if you push the crosswalk to where they typically cross, there's not good sight lines, yeah. there, especially for the Tannery Flats. Right. Yeah. As long so as there's a sidewalk to access where the crosswalk is yes. and then use the new sidewalk mm -hmm. that we're going to build. Great. Several people have made comments on this. You, you know, the speed signs mm -hmm. that go, and people have said, I don't know if they can be reprogrammed or, or if we're stuck with what we have, but if they say, if you're going like 10 miles over the speed limit, that they, they'll they flash, you know, like slow down, slow down, slow down. This particular one cannot but there are options and okay. more expensive ones. These are they're smart, just, but not that smart. Just, <laughs> um, not that, yeah. On some of the small feedback signs, the portable ones that we have, I noticed there's a strobe light that mm -hmm. comes right. out and yeah. flashes if you're going. Yeah, I, I mean, I think technically that's supposed to be off in that. Yeah, the, the state, certainly the state doesn't allow the strobe lights or any kind of, uh, Thing like that on, on theirs. So. Okay. I believe still have one of those. Is that right? So I guess the question is how do we strike Stowe Street? And um, like I said, the state will set our line strike for us for free. Uh, the fog lines or anything like that, it's on us. Um, they paint lettering? Not for free. No, no. They do the yellow line and, and that's it. You mean like saying slow or something like that? Yeah. Slow, slow to four letter, four letter word down? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can get that. I don't know. I think the, the option of you know striking it so it makes it appear a little narrow mm -hmm. might help. Yeah. People it, aren't paying attention to the speed limits. So well, I, I know. I pay attention to that. But it's probably better than nothing. You know, we probably mm -hmm. be striking anyway, so. The whole sheriff thing, um, uh, we've been over this. If it isn't this road, it's another road somewhere else. It's an ongoing issue that I, until you get hard nosed about it, I don't believe there's going to be any solution. And nobody likes to hear my hard nosed solution. So I'll say it again. Um, you know, the sheriff, we're going to, if we think about employing the sheriff, that's money out of our, out of our budget that we hadn't planned for. Uh, and even if we did plan for it, it have to come from somewhere. It's, either through higher taxes or cutting something somewhere else. Um, you know, you're talking about an eight hour day, you're pushing 300 bucks a day. Uh, if you did that once a week, uh, a couple times a month or something like that, I mean, that's not huge money, but it all adds up in the end. Um, right, well, the, unless I'm not the recommending road. it. Uh, yeah, unless you're willing to, in my opinion, uh, start doubling the fines. I know Tommy Rodney doesn't want to hear this. <laughs> Retroactive. <laughs> <back> <laughs> <laughs> right. The fines are, are pretty steep. I mean, that's, that's my, it's that's a my, that's my Speed pretty solution steep. is to either post signs that says uh, tickets will be doubled fines will be doubled, um, doesn't necessarily mean you gotta follow through with it. I, I'd like to see you follow through with it. Um, I, again, I don't know if the rest of the board members know it, I have a CDL license. Um, I'm very conscientious of how I drive all the time. In fact, we were going up to pick up a piece of uh, woodworking equipment there yesterday. My son asked me, why are you driving like an old woman? Uh, okay. And I said to him, I'll bet you there's people on this road that appreciate that because most of them don't. They drive like hell. 
you know. Uh, if you're going to employ a sheriff, I mean, when do the taxpayers that, that are abiding by the laws stop having to be on the hook for the, you know, bad uh, people's actions and uh, to up the fines, in my book, to pay for the officers that we're employing, in my opinion, is, is the way to go. But I know that's going to fall on deaf ears because it has in the past. So I well, apologize, Bill. No, no, it's, it's fine. Like I said, I wasn't recommending necessarily that we do it. I have said many times that, you know, without enforcement, it's difficult sometimes to expect people to, if, if, if people are driving out there now and they, they think that the chances they're gonna get stopped by a cop are next to nothing, they don't care much. If you have people out there enforcing it, people see the vehicles and they'll start paying attention. I don't have the ordinance with me. I don't know what the fine is. Uh, municipalities, you know, the, if you talk to a, a lawyer or the legislature, they're going to say that, you know, municipalities are to bear the responsibility of enforcing their ordinances, the, the, the cost. The, the fines are, are penalties that the people who, who, get the, who get the tickets have to pay. And when you combine the, the fine with the points on your insurance, uh, you know, it's, it's real money to a lot of people. Um, I don't think our, you know, we could, we, there's probably some room, but you, you're not gonna, if you set the fines at $300 for, you know, for going five miles an hour over the speed limit, I'm pretty confident somebody challenged that in court, the judge is gonna throw it out. So why do something that isn't gonna stick? I think the question is enforcement or not with our, with our, with the, the fine structure that we have. And if you wanna look at the fine structure, you know, they should be adjusted every once in a while, at least <clears> for inflation. But, um, you know, making them punitive is, I don't think it's gonna work. Well, I wonder if a progressive fine, you know, so many miles over, or so many miles over, the fine is this, so many miles more than that, the fine is a little bit worse. I think that's so, how it is. What's that? I think that's how it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Well, it's, it's how it is with the, with the state. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's that way. In the in our to look place. at it. I, I just wonder, Chris, and this is nothing, I agree with you in a lot of ways. But people who really, especially excessively speed, I don't think it's going to change their behavior. You know, they're just going to get pissed off about how much they have to pay. And I don't know if it's going to change their behavior. I, I Call me, you know, a pessimist on, on this scenario. But I, people who drive fast, drive fast. Well, there is the point system, so uh, right. <laughs> next time my son gets picked up, uh, he will be driving. <laughs> well, the other thing is, too, we've, we seem to speculate a lot about how right. people react. And until you initiate some change other than the status quo mm -hmm. that we've been doing and don't seem to be getting anywhere, you'll never know. You know, yeah. you can speculate till the cows come home. But. Well, I also think that if you expect, even if you start enforcing, if you expect that people are going to stop complaining about speeding, I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years. People complain about speeding in their neighborhoods all the time. It's, it's, and nobody likes it. And I don't blame anybody. If they blow by my house, I get mad. Nobody, you know, speeding is a fact of life. And, and don't expect that the complaints are just going to disappear regardless of what you do. So I think it's important to recognize we are we will we can continue to have this conversation for the rest of our lives and likely will. So a couple things to think about action wise are we've Bill's reached out and talked to the lieutenant. There has been increased presence. We can all vouch for that. If we start to see a decrease, we can again reach out and ask if there's a reason there's a lot going on and they need to be elsewhere, of course. Otherwise, we ask for that increase again. We can talk with Bill and agree on whether it's the white um, fog line, so what it is. Um, that should help as well, it's a small piece. The sidewalk so that the students, I mean the bottom line is safety, right? It's not just, oh, people are breaking the law so we wanna penalize them. 
people live there, they back out, sometimes they get hit. There's a school there with children who are crossing the street. So how can we make it safer, knowing that some people are going to speed forever? So that sidewalk is really important. It's gonna create a much safer environment so that when people are breaking the law, we at least know that our kids are in a safe place there. So some action items are to agree, and I don't know how we move forward with the painting and then have it happen, and then also stay on top of that the sidewalk project as well as the monitoring that's happening by the troopers. The good news, bad news with the line striping is <laughs> two years from now, it'll all be gone and we'll be able to do something different if it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, the sidewalk, is, the money is in the budget mm -hmm. this year. Um, we'd hope to have it done, have had it done before the paving happened. Um, that hasn't happened, but it is a relatively simple job just waiting on that engineer drawings. Okay, great. And I will correct myself before, because when we talked about sidewalks three or four meetings ago, I told you that we were doing it ourselves. We're, we're not. We're removing the sidewalks ourselves. We've got plans. There's going to be foam on the sidewalks, but uh, we're out to bid on the uh, contractor to, to place the concrete. Uh, we've got a state grant. It has to be bid. So. We'll be bringing that back. But the plan all along was the contractor was going to actually do the pouring of the concrete and finishing, and, uh, finishing of the sidewalk. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I, Roger, I didn't know that. But well, I, a I, couple I, of I, meetings I, ago, you I, I, I presented right. that and you <laughs> said something, and I said that we were doing it ourselves. So I'm just correcting the rest yeah. of the. Right. Yeah, I'll move that we follow uh, Danny's uh, recommendation on those action steps of. Uh, Asking uh, the town to paint the fog lines uh, to try to at least give the impression that it's a restricted zone. Uh, that we ask the uh, state two state troopers that are uh, contracted with to <coughs> increase uh, the uh, supervision of Stowe Street in particular uh, and generally uh, speeding when they, uh, whenever they can do it. Uh, and then we we'll forward with the uh, sidewalk work uh, as soon as we can. Is there a second to Roger's motion? Second. Second. Any further discussion? Do you need any more input, Bill, on width, or is that something you well, just figure you, out? If you want to give me a width. Um, I mean, uh -huh. you're the expert. But yeah. I guess I would say, in my general understanding, so again, echo everything Danny said is that the among many best practices, it sounds like one best practice is narrower lane width right. for speed. So my, I guess, intent in this motion would be that we're heading towards a narrower width. Mm -hmm. If that's the intent to slow speed, I don't be on that. Um, my other question would just be around parking. If we're, how is striping for parking going? I know, like for Main Street, there were some changes after the project where things that had been striped as spaces no longer were. Are we? Planning to stick status quo for parking, or is that a separate conversation? So, as are part saying of striping? on Stowe Street? On Stowe Street, like, are you going to stripe any well, parking? No parking. Well, <laughs> I was hoping we'd figure out how we're going to do center line and fog line, would most likely happen from the school north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I said, and Gary would back me on this, the width at Stowe Street or uh, Railroad Street to High Street is about 33 feet wide, which does not allow for two travel lanes and two sets of parking stalls right. for parking on each side of the street. And I think we know that if yeah. you, you go there, although historically everybody's parked on both sides of the street. Yeah, and right we, now we don't have an ordinance that restricts that. Restricts that. Um, some of these folks I spoke with would prefer parking on one side of the street in a bike lane that takes you to the mm -hmm. school, you know, up railroad, high street side, or we, parking stalls on one side of the street and the fog line continues down through. Um, yeah, I hadn't decided on, or I guess no one had decided on parking stalls from that area from the school to Union. Yeah. So knowing there wasn't enough width, I mean, we could put them in there improperly sized, which is what we've been always done. <laughs> you know, a, a width on Main Street is eight feet, and those ones up there might be six feet. Did we, did we have uh, stripes for parking on that part of the store street? We did, specifically in front of my sister's house, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, which is on the side railroad. Uh, we had three stalls in front of her, two or three, and then those. that was it. Um, Nothing on. We didn't have any on the on the 
west side of the street. No, not recently. I think we may have in the past. But we haven't, there's no signs that say no parking. There's mm -hmm. no striping that says no parking. No. So we, we're not able to take action to amend the ordinance tonight. If you, if you really don't want parking there, which would, I mean, I get half a dozen emails a year from mm -hmm. Gary who tells me that you can't get a fire <laughs> truck up yeah. Stowe Street and certainly up High Street. So if you don't want parking, um, we, we can amend the ordinance and make it no parking and stripe it no parking and put signs up no parking. We don't have anybody to issue a ticket right now if they park there. But, but we, we probably can't do that tonight because no. it probably hasn't been warned. Right, and I guess my question was just, how does that play into this consideration? So I'm hearing right. that we need the, to make a decision on lines. The parking, parking stalls are the easiest thing for us to take care of. Okay. The, the center line, which has to be done by the state, much harder to arrange, and the fog line also, the private contractor, much harder to arrange. Okay. Mike LaRock, who lives in town, can do the parking mm -hmm. stalls and very good at that stuff. How soon do you need to know about that? Um, this the parking, parking stalls? Right. No hurry. Okay. So we yeah. can move forward on the on the lines and lines, then yes. come the back. The state has told me they won't do the center. Won't give me a time for doing okay. the center line. Okay. So. so we'll defer a decision on the parking stalls for another meeting. But um, we have a motion. Um, do you want to read back the motion? I me? Mean? <laughs> I'm not taking that. I saw a listener was taking that. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> well, I For thought you were being So the I'm points I had Carla. that Danny made in the motion was um, that we move forward the action of asking the town to paint the fog lines to narrow the width on Stowe Street, continue um, working with the troopers to increase speeding enforcement on Stowe Street and generally, um, and continue to move forward with the sidewalk project. So again, I don't know that that's an action, but right. the action would be the paint. painting the fog lines to narrow the width. And the consensus seems to be narrow or yeah. travel. Yeah. Right. That would be what we we'll ask. Okay. So can I ask one last question here? Sure. What, what is the regulated width of a drive lane? Um, Main, Street's Main Street's 11. Um, and Main Street's pretty narrow in spots. You know, by you, it's closer to 12. Of course, there's no fog line there. But um, anything less than 10 is not really considered drivable mm. um so that was going to be my my concern are we pushing that limit on that and if so what liabilities no i think do from what i've I read ten and a half seems to be the sweet spot is to it makes it feel narrow enough that you slow down but does not really constrict movement as we get narrower your right side tires start to ride on that line mm -hmm. and wears it out and, yeah so as i said ten and a half seems to be the Sweet spot, and if it isn't two years from now, right. we, we either go 10 or 11. Or well, what brings this to mind is back when we were talking about um, Room 100 reconstruction, mm -hmm. the fact that the state agency of transportation came to us and said, We're narrowing up this stretch down through here uh, for vehicles, and then you've got your bike lane here on the side. By state law, you have to be three feet from a bicycle. Mm -hmm. And the other day, oh my God, a bike was riding right, a bike, pedal biker was riding right on the white line. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's putting himself in danger by hedging the being a hedge in that line. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, right. So, you know, it's a little concerning that uh, narrowing it up too much. Yeah. No, I mean, kind of issues, but. I mean, the, I think one of the hopes is that that white fog line keeps those people away from the sidewalk a little bit mm -hmm. so that when they zip by it, Roger's son zips by it 35 miles an hour. <laughs> he will Never pass. again. <laughs> you, don't, you don't feel it when you're standing on the sidewalk as much. You know, they're, you know, they're four feet out. Or, and one other thing there, and I, and I know we need to move on here, but the other day when I was coming down through Main Street, putting along, and uh, Lo and behold, I came up on to a young gal that was standing at the ball belt. There was a car in a parking spot just before that ball belt, and there was the light pole there. And so, help me God, she was there. Mm -hmm. I could not see her. I was from the front end of my vehicle was from me to Alyssa before I saw her, and she was waiting to walk across. Yeah. And I said, you know, so much for state standards. 
Yeah. I couldn't even see the woman who was waiting across and it, you know, it teed me off because I ended up having to drive through because there's no way I yeah. could slammed on But in place. theory, the ball belt protected her. She had a place to stand, not in the sidewalk, not in the road. She was right behind that light pole and the car, you know, and I just, I felt bad that I, yeah, I, I did too. You know, but, okay. I want to move to, to a vote but before that. Do we have any of the public that has any real concerns what we're, what we're being proposed before we vote? Any short comments? Uh, Conlon? Sure. Uh, my name is Kane, I live in the library center, top of Duffel. Um, talking about Stone Street speeding, when you all put that uh, uh, raised speed bump on the top of Guptal, slow that speeding right there. That thing was high enough to tear the axle off my goddamn car. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes. <laughs> and so when you, you talk about bringing in, paying for more cops for speed enforcement, I'd be far more concerned about ripping, ripping the axle off my car than getting pulled over and paying a $50 fine. Axle's going to be a lot more expensive. So I think, you know, you put it at the top of Stowe Street, Stowe Street you put it at the bottom of Stowe Street, it's going to slow people down. Thank you. Were you, are there any limitations to putting the speed yeah. bumps in the speed bumps? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, we kind of had an internal discussion on it. Um, I think the length of the street, we'd have to have numerous, which would be a lot. Um, speed bumps all have to be properly signed. There should be markings in the roadway as well. So um, they, you know, there's a lot more. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a class two town highway as well. I mean, it's, you know, when speed bumps are good for residential areas, the place that this gentleman's talking about on Guptal Road, we were skeptical about that because it's just, you know, um, people don't expect speed bumps on roads like that. And uh, we think that uh, for maintenance purposes, especially winter maintenance purposes, it's, it's really good to call to them. Okay. I think we're ready to vote. Uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Be opposed. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thanks, so, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Okay, next item: park planning study update. Steve. So, see you. Um, I think Alyssa asked for this to be on the agenda. As I. Uh, understand from Bill and uh, Melissa is your rep on the park study, so I um, want to make sure to give her an opportunity as well. But Bill asked me to come and give you an update. Uh, so the park study uh, was kicked off with our meeting on Wednesday, July 13th, and um, we had our steering committee, uh, which is about 10 uh, people at this point. It was a public meeting, it was uh, posted. Uh, put on the website and so on. And uh, minutes are available on the Planning Commission site. That's where we're posting the, um, the agendas and the minutes. Just so you know, um, we don't have a special page for this project because it's a um, kind of a one-time, limited time project. Um, so uh, I thought it was a very productive meeting. Uh, the consultant uh, SE group that we have contracted with. Uh, they're based in Burlington, and uh, so they um, really structured the meeting in terms of uh, outlining the course of the project. Uh, the next step is a site walk that's scheduled for a week from this Friday. It's uh, the 26th of August, and uh, we're going to start at 9 a.m. at Hope Davy Park, and uh, then will reconvene around noon at the ICE Center uh, area of the vicinity of the ICE Center. Uh, the purpose of this is really to um, give the salt consultant a chance to see the sites in detail and also for them to hear input from the steering committee and any, any members of the public that attend. Again, it will be a public meeting, be publicly uh, warned and so on. Um, the uh, third meeting is gonna be Thursday, September 15th. Uh, this is going to be what's termed a visioning meeting. It's an opportunity for uh, members of the public. It's going to be widely 
uh, advertise, we'll put it on Front Porch Forum, uh, make sure that um, we get as much promotional information out as we can, really to give um, opportunity for the um, consultant and steering committee to hear from members of the public about uh, visions people have for these uh, park areas, uh, potential new facilities. There's a group that you may be aware of that wants to build a skate park uh, down by the ice center, and um, there's an interest in additional soccer fields, uh, potentially other ball fields in that vicinity. So there is a number of new projects that will be discussed, and then also existing facilities, how they're managed, uh, any redesign topics such as potential relocation of the access road into the area of the ice center. Uh, one project that I'd love to see is for us to have some sort of a way to name that park. Mm -hmm. So uh, that may come out of these meetings as, as well as either a contest or some fun way to get some ideas and maybe bring those back to you on what we'll name that park instead of just the area by the ice center. <laughs> so, um, so those are the three meetings that are scheduled so far. There's um, the step after this visioning meeting will be uh, concepts that will be brought to you uh, in a public meeting. We're going to make sure to involve uh, you and the EFUD commissioners. Uh, Natalie Sherman is representing the EFUD, so they're directly involved in this whole project as well. Uh, the consultant has. Um, well, we've given the consultant base information on both park areas, and then they have done some field work for us since they've got the wetlands delineated for uh, both of the facilities uh, by their environmental consultant. The, the, that information has been uh, surveyed and will be incorporated into the base mapping for the projects. The goal is to have the whole project wrapped up by the middle of December. That's our hope. Um, and we'll, um, you know, we'll see how quickly we can move things along after this visioning meeting to get um, some, a couple initial concepts for both of the park facilities, and then, uh, and then we can go from there. So that's really where we are with the project. I think it's, uh, it's generally on schedule. We got a little later start than we hoped, just in terms of getting everything organized and, and so on. But we're trying to really keep it moving forward, um, keep it on track. And Steve, Thanks. you have anything to add, Melissa? No, that was the big thing, was to highlight the two dates. Um, Friday, August 26th, I am planning on attending, so if anyone has anything they want to highlight to me, or obviously Steve, to bring up. Um, and just to, again, it's now exactly a month out, um, but September 15th, um, mark on your calendar, and hopefully we'll stir up some front porch forum and otherwise excitement for parks planning because it's so exciting tell all your friends um it is going to be at the pavilion it will um, be it's in, maybe parked in okay. the pavilion that's the um, idea. and drop it like, so people don't um, need to come we're going to meet at five o'clock it's going to be five to seven it's going to be a drop-in event as opposed to like a presentation and a reaction it's going to be more of a poster event with opportunities for people to ask questions to provide input and um Great. and so on Thanks, that's great. Um, yeah. So one, one thing, I'm not sure if it percolates up to the select board. Um, I have been continuing to get some complaints about activities, unsanctioned activities in the, this golf course. Um, that, and I, I thought we were fairly clear with everyone when we set this uh, planning process up that while the town has been rather laissez-faire with the uh, this golf course for the last as long as it's been there uh, that um, we really are asking the this golf folks not to make any changes don't do any cutting i did send a, an email out to one of the disc golf folks today saying you know we've got this study going forward so i would just like the board to understand there's still a little bit of an issue and um, if you have any interactions with people who play disc golf just ask them to you know you can go out there and play nobody's saying we're taking the, the course down but they shouldn't be moving holes they shouldn't be cutting trees they shouldn't be doing anything except playing on the course that exists until we get this um, uh, study done and hopefully 
one of the things that the consultant is looking at is the disc golf course and how that fits into the Hope Davy Park and its use, right, Steve? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. That de definitely correct. I think there's been um, rub, I know, with at least one neighbor with the nearby Molten Farm. Uh, and I think there, there may have been an adjustment they were trying to make. That's been one of the things that I've worked with the disc golf course over the years is trying to uh, mitigate impacts to neighbors. But uh, I, I wasn't involved in this. Uh, yeah, and I certainly understand. So, but I they need to consult with certainly us understand sure. that, yeah. and I understand that the neighbors' issues. So I guess what I'm trying to do publicly is just ask for everyone's kind of patience, live with what's there now, and, and hopefully we'll address these issues with this master plan. And then in next year's budget, if, if changes need to be made, we can budget to do them. Uh, and it's, you know, I think everyone would be happy if, if we went that direction. Yeah. Yeah, so. One other thing I'll mention too is that um, we did have a complaint on wetland impact, a formal complaint to the state uh, wetlands office, and um, we had a field visit. This has been probably almost two months ago with um, Shannon Morrison, the wetland uh, specialist for our area, and um, one of her staff people. and. Uh, that complaint was resolved. We weren't, we're not in violation of state wetland rules. There are class two wetlands on within the uh, disc golf course that are regulated by the state. And uh, Shannon had some management uh, recommendations, but the current um, practice and use of um, oh, board, boardwalk across wetland areas, uh, location of holes, maintenance of holes, um, is in currently in conformance with the state wetland rules. So that was a good thing to find out that we're not violating any. Right. There, there'll be some recommendations, buffers along Thatcher Brook, some of the issues that we've tried to wrestle with over the years. So there, there will definitely be some recommendations, but at the moment we're not in a violation of any rules. So that was good to hear. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Okay, okay. you're very welcome. Okay. Thank you. Move on to um, the next topic, which would be the update on the uh, town manager selection process. Do you want to go, or do you want to talk about it, Danny? Number sure, four. I can, absolutely. Okay, sure. Um, so as everyone in this room likely knows, on Friday, the entire town lost internet connectivity. So instead of having uh, four interviews for uh, our town manager candidate, we had approximately four minutes of one interview. Um, so things have been pushed just a couple of days back, but we are interviewing seven candidates. Uh, we had four complete interviews today, and we have three tomorrow. Uh, the next step would be for the search committee to, um, at the end of all the interviews, we don't discuss in between, but at the very end we'll discuss, narrow it down to generally two or three candidates that we would call for in-person follow-up interviews. Um, and that process, isn't entirely defined, but will look like um, a, a longer process where they come in, they see the facility, there's a chance, there's a larger interview, which I believe consists of the two full boards, EFUD and the select board. Um, there will be opportunity for public questions or input. I just, we don't have, that's not entirely defined yet, so I don't want to misrepresent that piece, um, as well as um, meeting or chatting with a couple of staff members. Um, and that those candidates will be notified by the end of this week and then um, I don't know the dates yet for what that looks like. It's a lot of folks to line up for that in person. Um, anything I'm missing or any questions? The only thing is we had a total of I think 31 applicants which oh, yeah. we wound up, you know, whittling down to seven. We had, we had all the committee went either yes, maybe or no, so we eliminated people who got a predominance of no's and it was kind of a scoring system. So that's how we got down to uh, the seven candidates who we eventually wound up interviewing. We think we have a good broad pool of applicants and we're looking forward to you know, moving forward. I think we're in good shape mm -hmm. to get a, you know, a, a person on board you know, later this fall. Any approximate dates as to when you think you can get the two or three candidates 
in in front of the select board and EPUD. End of the month, I think, we're talking. Yeah, I don't remember specifically, but I think it, it you know it was as soon as possible. Well, we're talking about August yes, for sure. You know, we'll talk about this week. You know, notifying which candidates are going to be moving forward, and we'll probably get back to them with you know formalized um, you know candidate in interviews. But we'll reach out to the board because I know right. it's going to affect everybody's work yeah. and, and stuff right. like that. So we'll. Our board yeah. and the board, etc. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the public? Yeah, we just uh, you know as soon as practical, it would be great. You know, like we just heard about uh, September fifteenth for this uh, public input uh, park study. If we could set a, a date for public uh, review or however you're mm -hmm. thinking of getting the public involved, the sooner the better. To set exactly. that date would be great. We'll talk about that tomorrow at the end um, of the interviews. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Roger. Any other questions? If not, we'll move on to the Wausau grant application. Um, so this was a last minute addition by me, and if we don't feel comfortable taking action, we don't have to. As folks know, Wausau came in and presented about their new facility. I followed up with Matt and Burke after the fact, and you should mention grant applications, which was my old world. Um, there is a grant through the, um, actually, Department of Buildings and General Services at the state. They have um, recreation facilities, grant, human services, educational facilities, and regional economic development. Um, I'm clicking on it now. Um, I believe the human services one, um, she said, this seems like a fit, we'd like to apply. It allows up to three letters of support, so she just asked what the process was. I have not followed up with her since to say that they're definitely applying or when, but it's a September 10th deadline. Mm -hmm. um, so because I messed up on Mondays, um, if the board is comfortable authorizing a letter of support to support Wasi's application for that, um, I would assume they could work with Bill and I to on the language for a letter, but I don't know what, how that process normally is, just given the deadline. So are they I'm, applying for the money directly? Correct. It, not profits or an eligible applicant. It's not, it's applicant. Through, it's not correct. Through, correct. correct. So I'm, I'm applying for the same grant for work, so really super familiar with the process. They can provide us with a template um, and they can work with us or Bill or whoever wants to help, and then that way we can all read it ahead of time, suggest any edits, etc. And then all we have to do is put a signature on it. We can either vote on it in advance or just on the six, and that way it's prepared and just put a put a signature on the six, and then they'd have plenty of time to submit it with their application. Yeah, that probably is prudent. Again, I just wanted to raise it. For yeah, the thank you. But seeing as they have only requested. I don't know offhand. I think up to, um, uh, I think it's up to thirty-five thousand dollars. I will say for other that. nonprofits, I think it, 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 it's for shovel ready projects, mm -hmm. and it requires a one-to-one -one match of non-state or federal funds. So for a lot of small nonprofits, that can be a challenge to have the money in the bank, so to speak, because they've been doing a lot of their own fundraising for a long time. That's something I think is the case they are ready to do. So um, I think the recommendation seems pretty interesting. But I'm happy to follow back up and request formally for a next meeting. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, I'm definitely. I think and it's a great opportunity. Defer this until we get more information. And no, I'd be happy to move to that we uh, move forward with preparing that letter for signature for the next meeting. Well, I think they. I think they would. They would prepare for us. Like they'd have a template, a letter template, uh -huh. and send it to us. Okay. To review, and then we either sign it or suggest any or make any edits that we might want. So I don't know that we need a motion, but. Okay. Yeah, that seems. I think what I was thinking, with Danny, is that they would provide that to us, and then we just approve it at the next meeting. Or okay. It's just that uh, they need it by September 10th. Uh, it doesn't give us that much. If we have any changes that need to be made, uh, it's a pretty tight time frame to, for changes to be made. But I certainly can go. By consensus, the board supported drafting or working with Lossie to draft a letter of support for final approval on the Yeah, that that was. sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. okay, if there's no further questions, we'll move on to the manager's items. Uh, the 2021 audit report. 
Okay, um, the 2021 audit report is locked in the vault and I don't have a combination. No more time. I don't know exactly where it is. Uh, um, so at the next meeting, I'll distribute it to you. Um, if you prefer, I can send it to you electronically. You don't even have to have the paper version of it if you don't want it. Um, the audit, we, we do an audit every year, and uh, we're in, uh, I, I think we're in good shape. There are a couple things that the audit uh, has, every year auditors, they, you know, they try to find something for the $25,000 that we pay them to do this. And it really, uh, I wanted to uh, share with you the management letters of the audit report more than anything. Uh, because it informs uh, what I want to do on letter B. So I have uh, the management letters for December of 2020, for the year end of 2020 and 2021 here. Um, and it's not, you, you don't want significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. And uh, the town has no uh, material weaknesses, but the last two years, and every year before then, there have been a few deficiencies noticed. One in the 2020 report was the tax sale escrow account. Um, it, it didn't quite balance. We had a separate bank account where we, we deposited money um, that we had to hold on to. When we had tax sales, we sold three or four properties at tax sales. And uh, you know most of them were redeemed, but uh, we did issue one tax collector's deed, and there was a little bit of a discrepancy there, and I think we, we had a bank fee that was charged. So the response to that deficiency was, well, we're just going to put tax sale escrow money into the town's regular checking account, we'll just make a tax sale escrow fund and do fund accounting, and we're all set. Uh, they talked about the town should do a fraud risk assessment. That was in this year's uh, management letter as well. Uh, they'd like us to document and amp up our system of internal controls. I think we have a good system of delegation of duties. Um, if you know the people who deposit money. Uh, they don't balance the checkbooks. People who write checks uh, don't balance the checkbooks. We have uh, a process by which when we're gonna pay a bill, either the department head or I uh, fill out an expense coding form that goes to the bookkeeper with the invoice to the vendor. Uh, the bookkeeper prepares the warrants that you folks sign every week uh, and she prints the checks, the checks with the warrants go to the town treasurer. Uh, the treasurer waits until the warrants are signed before, they're, before the checks are signed and then they're issued. So we have a good delegation of duties, but uh, this internal control document is something, as I've mentioned to you many times, I'm not an accountant, I'm pretty good with numbers, I'm pretty good at financing projects, I can do budgets. Uh, I think we've, I think I've shown over the years that, that I've been able to shepherd the, the town's uh, money in an in a, in efficient and good manner. But coming up with this system of internal controls and these policies, risk assessments, control activities, information and communication, I just don't have that skill set or, or time to do it. Um, uniform guidance policies for grants. Uh, we have all of these policies, conflict of interest policies, the financial management policies, um, uh, other policies that are required by the federal government if you have federal grants. We have most of them, but some of them are not up to date. So what I would like to do, uh, I will get you the audit reports. Uh, who wants it? <coughs> A hard copy versus uh, electronic copy. Digital is fine. You want electronic. 
you want hard copy, you want hard copy, you want hard copy, you want All right, so at the next meeting, I'll bring enough hard copies for everybody who wants it. I'll send it out electronically to you. Do you want it electronically as well? Yes, yeah. So All right, I'll send it electronically as well. So anyway, um, those are the management letters for the last two years and the concerns. So uh, I'm for asking do are any of our employees bonded? Um, only through the L C T uh, their general the general budget bond. General budget bonds. We don't have individual specifics. Okay. Any That's my uh, it used to be common practice for municipalities to to bond the treasurer. That's why I thought the treasurer, the treasurer might have to be bonded. But uh, we have blank bonds right now. Okay. Did did they uh, give you any suggestion as to where their weaknesses might be in the fraud risk? Uh, um, or did they just say you need fraud? Yeah, so it just says the town has not performed a fraud risk assessment. A fraud risk assessment is important because it identifies vulnerabilities to fraudulent activities. Um, the fraud risk assessment would also identify processes, controls, and other procedures used to mitigate the identified risks. We recommend the town perform that. And it kind of goes hand in glove with those internal controls that I was talking about. So I think we have a really good system in place. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that fraud and embezzlement is impossible. Uh, you know, we, you just read the newspaper, you know it happens. Uh, I think we have a, a, a good system in place, but we should amp it up with, with policies and then provide a little bit more training to our staff than we have done. So you don't have to take any action on the 2021 audit report right now because you don't have it. But in letter B, what I would like you to do is allow me, authorize me to hire Mike Gilbar as a temporary employee to, uh, to uh, update the town's financial policies and procedures. Um, Mike was the CFO for the LCT. He just, uh, he retired last year. Uh, he is quite knowledgeable about all of these things. Um, and the reason I'm asking to hire him as a temporary employee is he doesn't operate a business. He doesn't have the insurances that you need to operate a business. So we hired this temporary employee. Um, so uh, somewhere that wouldn't be more than $65 an hour is what we would pay him. Uh, and then we would pay obviously the Social Security on top of that. And then uh, that uh, payroll would be audited in our in our insurance policies for workers' comp and unemployment. I did budget for this for this year uh, in the town's general fund budget. I have a professional services line other. Um, 7425 was last year's budget. We spent 7300 almost last year. I budgeted 17465 this year. Uh, some of the 17465 will be paid to the LCT for the manager search, and the rest of it will go to this. I, I think that this is going to, I don't have an estimate right now on the number of hours. I don't think that this will, it'll be a couple of hours a week. No, no it'll be all done by the end of uh, this year at the, at the latest. I'd like it, frankly, done before November 1st when the new manager comes on board so that these policies and procedures are in place. He can do the risk assessment. I asked him about that and I said, I have to go out and hire a consultant to do it. He said, no, it's just a checklist. He said, I, I've already, I, I have it already. So I don't expect this is gonna cost, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, but I think it's important to do. And I think it would be good if we had this in place before the next person on my position. We have a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve Bill hiring Mike Gilbar as a temporary employee to update the town's financial policies and procedures. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a I'll second it. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any
extensions, motion passes. Okay. And the last item uh, is Makersphere request to paint electrical boxes. Okay. MK Modeling is here on okay. Zoom. Hi, MK. Take it away. Well, uh, I'm not feeling great, but no. I'm here. I'm going to try to do this quickly. Um, I don't know if the last meeting I was at, um, I had talked to the woman in South Burlington who paints the electrical boxes there. And she is a retired art teacher and has worked with school kids to paint boxes. And um, when I was talking to her, she said, I don't recommend more than three or four kids work on a box at a time. So it being summer and it being lovely weather, um, I reached out to some parents and said, do you have kids who might be interested in this now? Um, it would just be easier to do it now than to involve a larger school group. So I met with um, four students and the artist who worked with us at Brookside um, a few years ago. And so those kids came up with a design we thought we'd just try one box, see how it goes. The one on Park, no, the one on Main and Stowe Street. And um, the design idea they came up with was to paint a train around the box. They were inspired by the train art that's up on the train bridge. Um, and then to have each side of the box be um, a different season. Mm -hmm. So that's what they wanted to do with it, and that's what I'm proposing. So I don't know what y'all think about that and mm -hmm. what to do next. So it's just interesting. Just that yeah. one box that they're going to do, that's it? Just well, start. no, we want to do the second one, but we want to see how the first one is received before we reach out to another group of kids to see. Okay. So did everybody see the photos that MK sent? Yeah. So are the kids in the photos, MK, are they the ones that are doing the painting? Yeah. 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 Anyone else have a question for MK? I think it's great. Yeah. yeah. I don't see any problem with that. That one loves trains. <laughs> So then what happens next? We, we just, we approve it and then you just move forward with the artist and the students and make it happen? Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Yeah. We'll get the box prepped and ready and then we'll spend time with the artists and students and um, hopefully get it done before school starts would be our goal. So in the next few weeks, if we can do it, whether cooperating. Does the electrical company have any requirements at all? Like a certain kind of paint or anything? It's a town box. The town yeah. box. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. we were planning on taping off the um, identifying information. So on the back of the box, it says property of town of Waterbury or whatever that is. So we would tape over that. So you could take the, you know, you wouldn't, we wouldn't paint over that. Okay. okay. I move we uh, let MK and their team of painters move forward with their train design. Thank you, Roger. Do we have a second? I'll second. Chris is seconded. Any further discussion? Any concerns from staff? No, do you have a question? I just asked okay. Bill if staff had any concerns and he said no. No, you, you don't need our help with this, right, MK? <laughs> No. <laughs> 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 I don't know if you can do something like this. <laughs> no, we don't need your help. <laughs> Good. Okay. If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Feel better, MK. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, MK. Feel, feel, feel better. Hope you feel better. Good night. Okay, uh, there being, unless there's any announcements or something, there being nothing before us, motion to adjourn. Uh, I'm going to be good at having a
I wonder if I might have two minutes. I, uh, I tried to be here for seven o'clock. Um, my name is Dexter LaFaber, running for State Senate. And I had these perfect plans of going to the Berlin meeting at six and having plenty of time to get here for seven. But they uh, had a site visit and they were going to yeah. back at 6.30. It's only 17 minutes from there to here, so I thought I'd still have plenty of time to be here by 7. But they didn't get back to 7, so um, much later than I wanted to be. But I did just want to come and introduce myself. I'm 11 days into my campaign. Uh, it's kind of a last-minute thing. I ran a uh, writing campaign. Can I just hold you where I should build the Are we allowed to have any political? It's your meeting. You can do what you want. It's what people's, I guess, I'm a little concerned because we might get a lot of candidates who will take a valuable select board time as much as I value. You know, if, if you want to write something to us, we have the Waterbury Roundabout that you could get information to the voters, but I don't know if a select board, it, it's, it's just a precedent. I, I don't know what everyone else feels. Yeah, we, we already, kind of ran across this with another candidate that uh, was interested in coming in and talking about basically the job position that she would currently hold and what she was hoping to move forward with. Uh, we felt that in all fairness to all candidates, unless we could give everybody a crack at it, then we can't give anybody a crack at it. And, and really appreciate you coming in here. Um, but I hope you understand our, our position. Yeah, it's sort of disappointing, uh, but yeah. I'm going to respect you. Yeah. Send something to the Warner Roundabout. I'm sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll be reaching out. I'm going to be doing all the above. Uh, okay. So just to, uh, Great. Attempt to get to meet you guys personally. Thank you for Thanks. coming. Thanks. Have a good night. Okay. okay. Sorry. Thanks, Matt. Okay. There's nothing else before us. Well, well. <laughs> 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 um, we were just wondering about the salt for salt liquor. Approved and signed by everyone. All signatures. Yeah, we would have just said consent agenda, but it was uh number. Right. Yeah. 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 See. Yeah. I was like, maybe they're just signing and not sitting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we did. It's all signed. <laughs> now you can go home and have a drink and tell us. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Glad you were here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll move to adjourn. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye, aye. Aye, aye. Mm -hmm. aye. Yes, sir.